Welcome to Night Talks, the University of Florida College of Journalism and Communications talk show produced by students for students. I'm Gracie Kurtz, a first year student studying journalism, and today our guest is Ezra's M. Suarez, a two-time Pulitzer Prize winning photojournalist who worked the Rocky Mountain News and the Boston Globe. He now leads EMS Photo Adventures. Hi Ezra's, thank you so much for being here today. Hi Gracie. So you were born and raised in Panama and earned your Bachelor of Science in Journalism right here at the University of Florida. Did you always know that you wanted to be a journalist? And what about your experience here as a Gator made you focus your career trajectory on photojournalism? Heck no, I had no idea. I, was, uh, I came to college to be a journalist. I was getting a specialization in magazine writing. I was getting a minor in zoology because I thought if I do all of that, I'll be working for National Geographic because I wanted to see the world. But, uh, you know, fortuitous meeting with the director of photography for National Geographic that came to visit with students and my advisor at the time, Helen Aller, she, uh, she forced me <laughs> to go to dinner with him and eight photo students and I was reluctant about it because I didn't know anything about photography and I told him, I'm studying this, this, this. Would I work for you guys? Can I work for you guys? And he's like, no. You have better chances you become a photographer. I'm like, huh. And I did. As simple as that, I switched. Thankfully, I had Professor John Freeman, who was so good at putting up with me and my constant questions on how do you do this. And I, I needed to get good really, really fast. And he was always there for me when I needed it. So. And I still stayed in touch with him all these years. That's why I'm here today. Wow, that's amazing. And it was while you were at UF that you actually did have the opportunity to intern with National Geographic. Tell us about that experience with such an iconic organization that was so important to your choice to come and be a journalist. I met him in August and I turned in a portfolio in December. Well, I didn't want to turn it in. My advisor took it away from me and she turned it in because I thought it was ludicrous of me to actually have done that and talk to this guy this way. And uh, I got a call back in January and he says, you know, Astros, I, I need somebody who speaks Spanish and English, knows a bit about animals, knows about the tropics, knows a bit about photography. So he basically described me. He says, I need him to help two of my photographers who are working on a salmon in Central America. And I was just, I, could, I couldn't speak, and that's hard, because I can speak a lot. <laughs> and, uh, and then he says, and it's a kind of a last, last minute decision, so I can only pay you $50 a day. I'm like, you're gonna pay me on top of that? So I would have done it for free. So once I had that experience, I kind of knew that photography will be my life. So there was just wow. no doubt about it. That's incredible. And then after you graduated from the University of Florida, you ended up working at the Rocky Mountain News um, as a staff photographer for seven years. Correct. I actually went there as an intern for six months. I figured, well, I, I had National Geographic. I had an internship with the Sun Sentinel. I, I must be good. And I get there. And after three months of being an intern at the Rocky Mountain News, my boss just followed me and she pulls me into her boss's office. They sit me down and they say, what the hell? I said, what do you mean? It's like, you're supposed to be good. We haven't seen that. And, and it's like, if you don't become better at this soon, after six months, you're out of here. And that put the fear of God in me. And it, I needed that, I, you know, that's when I got out of there, I became a sponge. I would ask questions all the time from the other photographers. Why did you decide to do this angle? Why that lens? What da, da 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 So I became better. And so, but they extended my internship two more times. For 18 months, I was an intern. But after 18 months, they finally hired me as a photographer, as a full staff photographer. Wow, you had to kind of play the long game there. Yeah, it's fine though. Um, this is not a job for me. This is my passion. Give me a camera and I'm happy. I might be starving, but give me a camera and I'm, ha and I'm happy, so. So while you were in Denver, what was the range of stories that you covered? One of the things that I'm the most grace, grateful about having worked in newspapers is the fact that you need to become a generalist. I am an expert covering events, covering news. I can, I can do portraits, I can do food, I can do uh, product, I can do studio work. You name it, I have done it. So 
because at the end of the day, even if I didn't like a specific type of photography, like food, I really didn't like doing food. I got better at it because at the end of the day, your name goes by that photo. And if the photo is not good, you don't look good. So it's a standard that I needed to keep regardless. And I'm very thankful for having learned all of that because it served me well now that I'm on my own. I have right now have a contract, a book contract in Puerto Rico. This company hired me for the 60th anniversary book. And they just let me loose. They give me directions, but they let me do what I do because they expect me to be able to do anything and everything. So never shy away from something you don't know. You just got to learn it. As a photojournalist, you often have a split second to find what you want, point and shoot. When you enter a scene, how do you survey your surroundings to seek out the exact image it is that you want to capture? So there's something that I teach. A lot of my time now is spent teaching. And it's called your bubble of perspective. Your bubble of perspective is how you see the world at any given time. From the moment you wake up in the morning, you're seeing the world at eye level at about 50 millimeters, which is what is known as a normal lens without counting peripheral vision. So when you get to a place and you see everything like that, if you just click your camera, you're boring the bejesus out of your audience because you're just repeating what the eye can see. However, if you're aware of that bubble of perspective, you can walk into a room and you can take that bowl and you can throw it in places. So when I walk into a room, I can already tell you if I were to put my camera behind that cameraman, use him as a foreground, I know how the photo would look if I were to put my camera up there. So I am playing the possibility. So I walk into a room and it's because I need to minimize the amount of time that I spend making decisions. You do that continuously and you don't think about it. So the moment I walk into a scene, I already know within seconds where do I need to be. Wow, so it kind of just altered how you perceive the world in general. I actually, at some point, mathematics messes with my head. There's something called dyscalculia. It's like dyslexia, but it's with numbers. And I was no good at numbers when I was in school. The written numbers just throw me off. In my mind, I can do them. So I talked to a psychologist once about it, and he said, well, your brain just perceives the world differently. And I think that's part of what makes me such a good photographer. I just see things weirdly. <laughs> And that's a good thing. Wow, and that, you know, that perspective that you have actually led you to receiving a Pulitzer Prize Award, your first Pulitzer Prize Award, um, for your coverage of the Columbine school shooting, which was a brand new type of horror in the USA. Was it challenging to photograph that trauma, both ethically and logistically? I had covered news. You know, I had covered accidents, uh, uh, the minor things, aftermath of a, of a shooting that kind of stuff. Columbine was a brand new beast because of the level of trauma that the whole thing caused. And uh, the day that Columbine happened, I was working out and I looked at the TV and it said possible shooting at Columbine. I'm like, huh. And then within minutes, it says confirm shooter, active shooter at Columbine. So I took off, I went straight away, picked up my gear and went. And it took about 25 minutes to get there. I was the first journalist not allowed in the perimeter. They had just closed the perimeter. I spent the rest of the day doing this, trying to get in, trying to get in. So I got people reacting and stuff like that. But I covered that scene for seven days. And my coworkers, after three days, a lot of them were calling the office and say, you gotta get me out of here. And I didn't understand why. On the seventh day, I have photographed a lot of people crying. And I, you know, I walked in and said, yeah, I'm not gonna photograph people crying today unless it's extraordinary, because I have so many of this. And I remember seeing a kid wearing a leather jacket, varsity football player, the quintessential high school player, thick neck, thick brow, big, big shoulders. And I'm watching this kid, I'm in the parking lot, the parking lot where all the students had left their cars, the ones that died, they had become impromptu memorials. And I'm in front of the pickup of one of the kids that died. And I'm seeing this kid across the park, for X, Y reason, I zoom in on him and I, I trained my lens on him as, as he got closer. I thought he was looking at me. No, he was looking at the pickup in front of me. And uh, as he got closer, you know, his face just became this mask of pain and his shoulders started shaking. And by the time he touched the truck, it was just a grimace of pure pain. And at that moment, had my cameras not been on my shoulders, they would have fallen to the ground because apparently I dropped the cameras and I have tears running down my cheeks and I didn't understand why. I called the office and I said, I think you got to take me out of here, I guess I need a break. Later on, there's the people that wanted to be taken out earlier, it's because they had kids. So to them, it impacted them more. I have no kids, so it took me longer, but the emotional scars in your psyche, they remain. I'm just very good at compartmentalizing everything in my life, and I don't think on those things unless you ask me about them.
Right, and you know, even though it does take a toll on you, why do you think it is important for photojournalists to capture moments of such grief? You know, I heard a term recently, somebody said that human beings are storytelling animals. We live by the storytelling. So that's the reason why, I was just explaining this to a previous class, back in the day when we lived in caves, when the hunters came back from the hunt, and they sat around the, the fire to tell the story of how one of them got stumped by the woolly mammoth. The other ones paid attention. We, learned, we paid attention to the things that are bad so it doesn't happen to us. It's a survival thing. It is very, very important that we tell the story of what happens. Somebody has to. People need to react to it. People need to be aware of it. The ph photographers and journalists, we have an unspoken contract with our audience that we're there to document because you cannot be there and you have to trust us that we will do it in the most accurately and honest possible way. So continuing your path with storytelling, in 2002 you went and you worked for the Boston Globe as a staff photographer. Was it an easy transition to a new noise organization and city? The Rocky Manus was a fantastic place. They had amazing staff, extremely talented photographers. Uh, they're the ones who taught me a lot of what I know. But they only went so, you know, that newspaper, because it was only so big, when it went so far. When September 11 happened, I was in Panama on vacation. I won't forget, out in the treadmill, I look up, I see the first plane hit the, the building. I'm like, wow, what a horrible accident. Then I saw the second one. I'm like, this is no accident. So I ran back, I called the States, and, and I said, I'm, I'm, trying, I'm gonna get back. It took me 11 days to be able to get back in the States. I, I go from the airport to my boss's office as I'm ready to go. I go to New York, I go to Pakistan, wherever you want me to go. And they tell me we haven't been given that go ahead to cover the story. So I went all the way to the editor of the paper. I just walked into his. I'm like, are you out of your mind? You're not going to cover the story. I might be young in the profession, but I kind of know this is going to change our lives. And he said, Estrus, you know what? Maybe we just don't cover the kind of stories you want to do. I'm like, okay. I walked off, opened my little flip phone. <laughs> I called the Boston Globe, who had offered me a job, and I took it. So. I, I was always looking at bigger things. So when I got to the new place, the hardest part is that Boston is really hard to navigate. It's like a bunch of cow trails that were paved. It's extremely hard. But no, I, I, I asked for it. So all the big assignments, the wars, the disasters, I wanted to do that. So no, it was just the logical sequence of events. And then around the same time, you actually started EMS Photo Adventures. Yep. What inspired you to found EMS and what services do you provide? Okay, so EMS Photo Adventures, it's the, the definition of what it is has been evolving. Basically, I teach people how to become better photographers. Anybody can learn the techniques. I teach you how to see differently. It is how you see the world that will make you a better storyteller. So when I take people on location, I teach them how to get better photos, how to best document. I design the programs for me. I don't want to be bored, so the people that come along with me, they're just basically seeing what I'm doing and, I, and I'm teaching them how to do it the exact same way. So it's fun, it's just fun. So if I'm an aspiring photographer, I you know, t talk to EMS and you take us somewhere. Well, get me eight people and I can take you anywhere. Wow, what, what, where were some places you've been? Uh, I've taken people to Ecuador, to Ireland, to Cuba, to Panama, uh, in the States, New York, um, LA, San Diego. Uh, I've done them in, I've done them in, Ch in the Emirates, Charja. So I, I were, I've taught workshops all over the place. Wow. And, and it's fun because I do get this vicarious enjoyment of seeing people get in it. You know, when you explain something and they show it to me, it's like I feel like a, like a proud papa. That's really admirable. A lot of photographers operating at your high level don't take the path to educate others, but you share your wisdom. I have had great teachers in my career, starting with Mr. Freeman. And then the people that I work with at the, boss, at the Denver Rocky Man News, they were never selfish with their knowledge. And I, I will never forget, because of them, I started to understand. So I'm all about sharing my knowledge and you know, helping people become better photographers. Regardless of the situation, when people notice a camera pointed at them, they tend to react in some way or another. How do you walk the line between being inconspicuous for the sake of the photo while also being open and honest with your subjects. One of the reasons it's good to get older is because you become wiser. You need to walk the world with an open heart, open mind, and open spirit. And to this day, I apply that to photography. When I walk out there, you can, I cannot hide what I am. I have a waist pack, I have two cameras on my shoulders, I have a, a hat on me. It's obvious what I'm doing. So 
I always assume that people want to be photographed by me. And when I find somebody interesting enough to be worthy of a photo, I make the photo and then I usually engage the person. I live in a world where it's easier to ask for forgiveness than it is to ask for permission. And I would say 98% of the time that always works. The tools of a photographer are the following. The most important tool is the six, eight inches behind the camera, your brain, how you see the world. The second tool is your eyes. The third tool, this or this, whatever photographic device you have in hand. And the fourth one is a big old smile because this thing actually makes people react and it's gotten me out of very bad situations. So, but when I photograph someone, it's because I truly find them fascinating. So when I show them the photo, usually I'm like, oh, that's cool. Can I have that? And I give it to them because I, you know, what else am I going to do? I use it for teaching purposes, but I just tell people, I'm like, look, I found you worthy of a photo. Who says no to that? Most people say yes. All right. So you don't really play the role of the fly on the wall. If I am doing a documentary essay where I'm documenting a specific theme, topic, story, I try to. But just by being there, you're kind of affecting the scene of sorts. So it depends. It depends. But nowadays, I walk around with a big old smile. As a matter of fact, if, if you follow me, EMS Photo Adventures, uh, in Instagram, I, I do not, I learn. Young people have taught me that you got to do reels. And the reel that I posted today is me engaging a random stranger in in Havana and you can, you can see how I go about it. And I'm always laughing, I'm always joking with them and I show him the photo. I think that guy, I told him, when you're born to be a movie star, you're a movie star. And the guy was laughing, of course, because I found him interesting enough in that moment. For me, he was the star of my little movie. So yeah, that's how I go about it. So you said that you earlier, you said you consider yourself to be a generalist yep. rather than a specialist. Despite being well-versed in so many different categories, what subject brings you the most fulfillment to capture? I love doing street photography because if you can find the aesthetic balance in the chaos of daily life, you can do anything. Um, one of my, my shooting mantra is keep shooting, keep moving, keep adjusting. Keep shooting, keep moving, keep adjusting. You take those three verbs and they can pretty much get you out of trouble 95, 97% of the time. Anything in front of you, if you keep shooting, if you keep moving and keep adjusting, you will get the shot. Being able to see chaos and being able to put the people in the right place, being able to capture the decisive moment, being able to see the light, how it affects everything and how everything, put it all together in a split of a second, that makes you really good. If you can pull that off, you can pretty much do anything. So people, short answer, I love people. People, yeah. being at your level of a photojournalist, is there any sort of gear or equipment that you gravitate towards most? Okay, at this level, when you spend this kind of money in gear, it doesn't really matter what brand you have because they all compete pretty, they're usually pretty, they're pretty close to each other. I'm a Nikon guy. I started in Nikon. They forced me for five years at the Boston Globe to use Canon. And eventually I stepped away from that and I came back to my own Nikon to the point that I bought my own gear. I bought my big lenses just so I wouldn't have to use Canon because I'm so familiar. This is an extension of who I am. I don't have to think about it. I am the camera. I know where the buttons are. As a matter of fact, one of my editors uh, early in my career gave me the advice about it becoming an extension of who I am. He says, put it by your bed at night and in the darkness, play with the buttons, try to set up a specific setting and then check. And that's how I become familiar with my cameras. I can do stuff without having to look at it. You know, a lot of photographers, you know, really like invest in really high quality cameras. Do you think that having like super high pixels and all of these, you know, details are crucial? Content is what matters. I don't care how beautiful your pixels are. If the content is not interesting enough, why would somebody want to look at your photos? People get really hung up on, oh, I can see the pixelation. Who cares? Is there a great story there? Do you react to that image? Can you, can you pitch, picture yourself in that situation? That's all that matters. Storytelling is king. So then you were the recipient of the Robert F. Kennedy International Photojournalism Award for your piece titled Osvedi's Journey. Can you tell us about your experience following that story? So, the story was about a, a migrant boy with $17 in a van overturned in a lonely road in Colorado, rural highway. Two of them died, one 14, one 17. Instead of putting the bodies in pauper's graves, the community felt bad, so they actually embalmed the bodies. And the community, the migrant community, gathered enough funds to send the bodies back to Guatemala. Our writers at the Rocky Manus actually helped find this, the town where they came from. They, a lot of great investigative reporting. So I followed the bodies back, one of the bodies 
back from Denver all the way to the border of Guatemala and Mexico. And the, the last part of the store was three days of traveling in planes, then one night of full night of vigil. Then the next morning they put this, they put the, the casket in the back of a pickup truck. It's like eight hours. The roads keep getting from bad to worse to is this really a road kind of stuff. Finally, we end up coming in this tiny town near the border with Mexico. They, the word had come out that we were coming. The local villagers from where he was were waiting. They put the, the big box on their shoulders and they hike up the mountain. A normal person like us, <laughs> the hike would take like two hours. These guys with a 500 pound box on their shoulders, they didn't have 45 minutes. And, uh, and I'm trying to keep up with him. I'm exhausted. I haven't slept. I'm not eating well. And uh, there's a shot of, in, the essay, in the essay where there's a, a valley and you can see this little path and you can see a lineup of people in the foreground. There's the big white casket and on the top is the village and the people looking down. And it's a great shot. And when people see that shot, it's like, wow, you, you were amazing because you thought on those terms. Not really. I was leaning against a tree throwing up because I was so sick. Like I had gone beyond the point of exhaustion. So I saw that. I made a couple of shots. Breath in breath out and I ran to the last part and then when I got there they already had opened the box and the body and they had the box in the middle of, of the hut and that's the main photo of the essay so uh, but when I did that story I was never thinking of awards I was you know I just wanted to tell this this story that even though I photographed that in the year 1999 it's still relevant today to the point that the next day when I went back to the village they were getting ready to bury the kid you know, I have, I have a photo of one of the kids I helped dig the, the grave. And the kid is leaning on a shovel. And in the background, you can see the mountains. And in the background, it's actually Mexico, right where they cross over. I asked this 11-year-old kid, so what are you going to do when you grow up? I want to go to El Norte. Cycle repeats. And to this day, people are risking their lives to get here. So it's a great story. And you know, not only are you capturing these stories, you're immersed in part of the story. And something else I'm getting is you, you care about your subjects. I you do. care about what you photograph. I think you, you need to care. Even if you don't care, why would the people looking at your work would care? You need to be empathic. I think you always need to, the human being, you're born a human being and you're going to die a human being. This, what we're doing, it's great. But if it comes to saving a life or taking a photo, I probably will be taking a photo as I'm saving a life. <laughs> They're like, ah, come here and I'll take the photo. But I also am very much aware that the moment I affect that, from that moment on, I cannot document that life anymore if I affected it because it's no longer what was going to happen. It's what I made happen. I cannot do that anymore. One of the more recent events that you covered here in the U.S. was during the Capitol insurrection on January 6, 2021. Did you know what you were walking into that day? Sort of. Not to the extent that what I saw, but sort of. I had been exposed to the Oath Keepers and the Proud Boys. And I realized, aha, uh -huh, to these people, I'm an enemy. I need to be very, very careful. I had clashes with them. So I kind of knew they were an extremist group within the extreme groups of the supporters of this guy. And uh, so when that day came, I sort of knew that I needed to be out there. I, I waited until they started heading to the Capitol because I wasn't sure if I was going to do it. I wasn't on assignment. I put myself on assignment. I had my bulletproof vest on. I had my tear gas mask to my, strapped to my leg, my cameras. I had my Kevlar helmet. And, uh, and I was one of the few people in that crowd wearing a mask in the middle of COVID, people dying. And I have photos of people screaming and you can see the spittle backlit and in the middle of COVID, knuckleheads. And, um, but at, in order to get to the doors where all the chaos was happening, I was gonna have to push my way through all of that. I'm like, it's not worth it. So I looked around and the scaffolding from Biden's inauguration was already up. So I just went up on the sides and had a big lens and I got everything with a big lens. And then eventually the Capitol Police were able to subdue the crowd. They used tear gas. I just put on my tear gas mask and I kept covering and I did it. But yeah, I, I was confronted a bunch of times that day. And when I get confronted, I usually just turn right up to them, square off. And I'm like, yes. And they're like, what are you doing here? I'm like, I'm covering history. And then it is up to them how they interpret it. A lot of the people that I said that to are like, yeah, isn't this historic? And I'm thinking to myself, you dummy. This is history, not the kind of history you're thinking, but it is history, so I know I need to be there. You don't lie when you're a journalist, you don't misrepresent yourself. Uh, I told him I was working for Zuma Press because I have a relationship with them. It's an international agency, so I knew my photos would move through them, so I would tell them I work for an agency, it's international, and they kind of leave me alone. But if you coward, they see blood, they feel blood in the water. I had a friend who got beat up that day. 
Oh, so when you're covering events that involve conflict, like show up in riot gear and you are prepared, but are you ever scared for your own safety? Whoever tells you they're not scared, they're lying. The difference between, between being brave, quote unquote, and being scared is whether you're gonna let fear freeze you. You gotta think of fear sharpening all your instincts. You hear better, you see better, you're hyper aware of your surroundings. Movement is life. You stay still, you're gonna get beat up probably, or you're gonna get crushed or something. So you keep shooting, you keep moving, you keep adjusting, and you just go through it. That's it. In professions such as photojournalism, it can take a toll on your mind and body. And fitness is a very important component of your life. In fact, you've worked out how many consecutive days 1, now? 1,527 days in a row, nonstop. That's that over. That is insane. Over four years. How does investing in your body and mind translate to your success as a photographer? I have to be physically prepared to do anything and everything. I will do anything for a photo. I will climb, I will drag myself, I will jump. If the photo is worth it, I will do it. I do not understand how you can be in this world and not take care of your body. You take care of the body, the body takes care of yourself. I'm a big proponent of being functionally fit. Aesthetics, they don't, they don't matter. If you look good, if you look symmetrical, I could care less. It's a matter of, with longevity, are you gonna be able to pull this off? You need to be able to take care of yourself and take care of your loved ones. Taking care of your body will help you do that. So to kind of wrap up our conversation that we've had, what advice would you share to aspiring photojournalists? Okay, don't wait for someone to give you an assignment. Give yourself the, the assignment you want someone else to give you. A lot of publications, a lot of sites nowadays, they'd rather you show up with an already started story and say, look, this is the potential. And if they see the potential in it, they're probably, they're gonna back you up. So the other thing is try to see the world anew. You say you're, you're from Jacksonville. I am. Right. So going back home to Jacksonville, and I tell you, okay, this is your task. You cannot move away, but five blocks away from your house. And I want you to give me great stories out of that. That is extremely hard because that is extremely familiar for you. So what you need to do is you need to train yourself to always see everything anew. It doesn't matter how many times you've seen it. It is your responsibility as a storyteller to find a new way of telling that story. Same with photos, same with words. Thank you so much for your insight, Ezra's, on the world of photojournalism and your journey as a storyteller. And a big thank you to our viewers for joining us. Until next time, good night.